Well, happy Mother's Day. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Just what I wanted to hear, the wrath of God. Bear with me. So, this is a tough uh, message to hear, but it's not as tough, perhaps, as it may seem. It, it, it is a tough message, but um, I think it lands on us a lot harder than it ought to because, um, because of the way Paul is, is writing this letter. Last week, we began this conversation looking at the letter to the Romans, and um, if, if you were here last week, if, if you weren't here last week, you can catch up online, but if you were, you remember that what, what Paul uh, was doing is writing a generic letter or a general letter. Paul didn't know the church in Rome. He'd never been there, and he, he, was, he understood that some, some people he did know were there, but he didn't know for sure because he wasn't there. Um, and so he just wrote that letter in the most general way possible. So Paul is not writing to anyone in Rome in particular. He's writing about people in general. And in the same way, he's not writing to you um, uh, in particular. He's writing to people uh, in general. So that's one way we can say, well, all right, so maybe, maybe he's not writing to me. Maybe he's not thinking about that thing I'm thinking about. But there's another reason we can think about that, because Paul is using... Uh, a, a technique in the ancient world called the diatribe. Many of you uh, think you know what a diatribe is because somebody has, has uh, harangued you in the past. Somebody has been uh, vicious in, in uh, assaulting you verbally. And so you say, that person has subjected me to a diatribe. And that's what the word means today. A diatribe means a, a vicious um, uh, a, a verbal assault. But in the first century, what it meant was... was um, was, and if, if, you're, if you listen to our passage from Romans, maybe that's the way that that landed on you, is a vicious uh, verbal assault. But the way it works in the, or worked in the first century is there, there is an assault, but it's on an imaginary opponent. So if you think instead of, uh, you know, kind of social media, this person wrecked that other person, right? This person de demolished them, right? What Paul is doing is he's setting up a, a, an imaginary conversation partner, and then he... he um, does, he does his best to explain the point that they're coming from, and then he, you know, he demolishes it with facts and logic or whatever he does, right? Paul is having this conversation with another person. So you are not the you in this sentence. You is the person he's talking to, this imaginary person. You are the audience that Paul wants to bring to his side. He wants you to leave the auditorium um, saying, I think Paul got the better side of that argument. That other, you know, the imaginary person, that other person who was in the conversation didn't do a good job. Now, you know, the, the danger there is that Paul will misrepresent his opponent. But, but assuming Paul is, is anticipating questions that the audience has, then he's able to answer it without actually uh, pointing the finger at anybody in the room. So, so Paul is using a diatribe technique. He's, he's set up this imaginary person who is saying, yeah, that's right, or no, that's wrong, Paul. And then he's having that conversation with them. So, so Paul is having a uh, diatribe conversation with the people in this, um, in this reading. And um, so, uh, so when we get there, that will help us to understand uh, what, what um, Paul is saying to us, if anything. But before we do, we have to catch up with where we are now, because last week we left off in the middle of chapter 1, and Paul, what we saw last week is Paul is saying, the gospel is good news for everybody. And then in the second part of chapter 1, he lists some people who obviously need some good news, people who have done wrong. He lists, he, lists, um, uh, he talks about Gentiles who, have, who do all these various bad things, and and so Paul is, is talking to his, uh, for his audience to hear, and he's anticipating the audience would say, that's right, those are bad things. People like that shouldn't do things like that. They're bad people, and God is going to judge them for sure. So that's, that's the place he's left off at the end of chapter 1. And then he says, he, he says, but what about the insiders, right? The outsiders, they're, they're guilty because even if they never heard a word about God before, God gave them a conscience. You know, you don't have to be religious to know you shouldn't rob banks. You just shouldn't have to, you know, you don't have to go to church to find that out. You shouldn't have to be religious to know that you shouldn't 
be a human trafficker or uh, invade the, the country next door. There's things that your conscience should tell you are wrong. So Paul's saying that when people go against their conscience, that they are under God's judgment. So he's saying those outsiders, even though they've never been to church a day in their life, even though they never heard a word about God or anything else, God did give them a conscience, so they're guilty. And the audience that, that Paul is writing to, he imagines, would say, that's right, they, they sure do. Those things are wrong. And then he kind of springs a trap. He says, so, uh, and again, this is on his imaginary um, uh, conversation partner. He says, so you, every single one of you who judge others is without any excuse. So why does, why does he say that? What, what, what have they done that makes them um, a guilty? Well, he hasn't told us yet, but he says they don't have an excuse. He's saying, if you agree that people who don't know anything about God are guilty when they do wrong, then certainly people who do know something about God don't even have their excuse. You know, you've got a conscience and you know something about God. So, so you have even less excuse than, than the people on the outside do. So that's, that's the, the, what he's getting at in verse 1. He says, you condemn yourself when you judge another person because the one who is judging is doing the same things. Now at this point, the imaginary conversation partner is saying, well, I agree with you. I would have less excuse, Paul, but I don't do those things. I, I don't do those things. I'm, I'm good, you know. Look at me, I'm, I'm so awesome. And, you know, Paul, Paul, uh, <laughs> Paul could say a lot of things to that, but what he says is, we know that God's judgment agrees with the truth, and His judgment is against those who do these kinds of things. What does he mean by that? He means, well, first of all, um, maybe you do, maybe you don't. And maybe your conscience is clear, and you sleep like a baby, but, you know, the thing is, you're not the judge. He says, God is the judge. So, you know, you might search your heart a little more diligently. You might ask yourself, am I really not doing those things? Particularly if you have the law, if you've been given knowledge of God, then you can understand better why your conscience might, you know, tug at you sometimes. You might say, oh, okay, when God, you know, makes me feel this way about robbing banks or whatever, what he's really getting at is, you know, I shouldn't, I shouldn't oppress other people by taking what's theirs. So, so you, have, you have a better understanding. You know, uh, God says, love your neighbors yourself. You know, I challenge you to figure out how you can rob a bank lovingly. So, you know, <laughs> you know may, maybe it's possible. But Paul is saying, be careful, right? Because you have less excuse and you're not the judge. You know, God is the judge. God, um, we, we know that God's judgment agrees with the truth. Now, when he says we know, he's saying, you know, surely you will agree that God's judgment agrees with the truth. And, and he would. He would say, yes, God is the perfect judge. God knows all the facts. He knows, he knows all the extenuating circumstances. God knows every excuse we could possibly think up and then some. God is a perfect judge. But God is the judge and not us that that. We need to be careful about saying, well, I'm, I'm a good guy because, because I sleep well at night. Well, maybe and maybe not. You're not the judge. So he says, what if you do? Verse 3, if you judge those who do these, these kinds of things while you do the same things yourself, think about this. Do you believe you will escape God's judgment? If you do, you know, th think this through, you know, if so, you know, if, if you're doing great, if you're doing good, great. We'll get to you in a minute. But he says, think it over. How is God going to judge you? Do you believe you will escape? Do you believe you will escape? He's saying, do you think that, that the fact that you're an insider, you know, I, I show up at church every week, God. You know, okay, sure, all right, I kind of do the same things they do, but I did go to church all the time, right? I read my Bible faithfully, right? I... I <laughs> I was a preacher, right? That, that if, if we think that we can get a pass because we're insiders, Lazarus, come forth. <laughs> no. Um, if we think we can get a pass because we're insiders, um, then uh, we're wrong. So um, where are we? So do you think you'll escape God's, God's judgment? So... Um, all right. Um, 
That's bold face. <laughs> so he says, he says um, the fact that you're an insider, you know, far from, far from excusing you, actually would make you, um, have, would take excuses away from you. So do you think that somehow you'll, you'll get, um, uh, you'll escape God's judgment? He says, or do you have contempt for the riches of God's um, generosity, tolerance, and patience? You have contempt for this. Um, do, you, do you look at other people's punishment and say, well, I'm not getting punished, so God must approve of me? Do, do we, you know, we, we look at the bank robbers, and they're going to jail. And we say, I'm not going to jail. I must be doing good. He says, do you have contempt for the fact that, that um, not everything, God doesn't have to intervene in every, in every wrongdoing. Right? A lot of wrongdoing God can be patient with. God can say, actually, in the case of a bank robber, God can say, society has structures to deal with that. I don't have to zap that guy with lightning. Right? He robs the bank, he goes to jail, he can't go into banks anymore. You know, maybe an ankle monitor or whatever they do. Right? But he can't go into banks anymore. Right? Problem solved, and I never had to strike him down with lightning. So God can afford to be patient with a lot of people. He says, do you have contempt for that? Do you have contempt for the fact that God has not struck you down with license, uh, with, with license, with um, with a lightning? He says, "Don't you realize why God is doing that?" He says, "God's kindness is supposed to lead you to change your heart and life. God's kindness is supposed to lead you to change your heart and life." And it's it's worth pausing there because, you know, I think Christianity gets a bad rap because you know. No one wants to read through this, this diatribe and figure out, you know, is there any grace in here? But, but Paul is saying, no, there's totally grace. You know, people think, you know, a lot of people, Christians and, and uh, insiders and outsiders, think that the, the way that God motivates people to change their lives is through guilt or through fear. That, you know, uh, sinners in the hands of an angry God or something like that. That, you know, you better watch out because, you know, Judgment is coming soon. Paul says, no, no, it's actually kindness. Kindness is what God uses to motivate people, not fear, not guilt. So if you're following in the outline, God leads us to repentance with kindness. So you might just think that over. So. He goes on in verse 5 and says, You, you imaginary person, you're storing up wrath for yourself because of your stubbornness in your heart that refuses to change. God's just judgment will be revealed on the day of wrath. So isn't this fear? It, wait, what happened to kindness? He's storing up wrath, right? How, you know, help me understand this, Paul. And he says, he says, of course, if, if you have time, you know, if, if you do nothing with the time that God has given you, then yes, there's that much more on, on the books, that, that God is keeping track of all this stuff. And um, if, if you don't change your hearts in life, then yes, there's all that much more um, stuff you're carrying around with you. And God is not going to allow any wrongdoing, any, any evil, any harm to enter into the age to come. So it will have to be dealt with at the end of this age. So he says, you're accumulating with every day you put off the, the, the change, um, with every day you fail to take advantage of God's kindness, you are accumulating a, um, a, a treasury of, of wrath, but the wrath is on, on the things that you have done that are wrong. So then he, he teases this out some in the next several verses. He says, God will repay everyone based on their works. Now, I'm, I'm going to steal his thunder here because he's not talking about getting into heaven. He's talking about being repaid according to your works. So, you know, we're still in chapter 2. He's got, you know, 14 more chapters to go. So, so hold on to that, right? When he says God will repay everybody according to their works, he's not saying you get into heaven based on what you do. He's saying there will be a reward. God will notice. And he says, on the one hand, he will give eternal life to those who look for glory, um, honor, and immortality. I keep doing that. Immortality based on their patient good works. But on the other hand, there will be 
wrath and anger for those who obey wickedness because the, uh, instead of the truth because they are acting out of selfishness and disobedience. So he says God is paying attention and there will be an accounting, there will be a reckoning. And if you've done good, then God will reward that. And if you haven't done good, then God will have to deal with that too because you're not bringing it into the age to come. So one way or the other, the books are going to be balanced. The books are going to be cleared at the end of this age, at the beginning of the next age. God's going to deal with all those things. And, you know, that just makes sense. You wouldn't expect a, a crime lord to be treated the same um, at the end of this age as you would expect, you know, a, a nurse who's, who's working in a war-torn country. You know, you just wouldn't expect that. And he says, no, you wouldn't, and that's not what's going to happen. So he says that the day of wrath is a day of wrath for some, but it's also a day of rewards. The day of wrath is a day of rewards too. So that's the second point in the outline. And then he, he essentially repeats this. Um, he, he repeats the point, I think, to, just to drive it home. He says, there will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, for the Jew first and for the Greek. And the point he's making there is the, the Jews are the insiders and the Greeks are the outsiders. He's saying that there will be an accounting and it will be for the people who do good and the people who do wrong. It will be for the insiders and for the outsiders. God, he says, um, he says uh, there will be glory and honor. God does not have favorites. That nobody gets a pass. God will not look at the, the outsider and say, well, they didn't know better. You know, they robbed that bank because nobody ever told them they shouldn't rob a bank. They don't get a pass, and neither do insiders who, if anything, have less excuse. So, so Paul wraps it up by saying that God does not have favorites. God is capable of separating all the factors out. God, God can look at us dispassionately. God is capable of judging, but we are not. So what is Paul getting at there? Paul is simply saying, don't look down on those outsiders. Don't, don't say... Well, maybe I shouldn't, you know, be so hard on the, the bank robber because, you know, whatever. I, it's not my place to judge. Yes, he is saying that. Don't, he's, he's saying don't judge other people. You don't know their story. You don't know the extenuating circumstances that might exist. God is a capable judge and you are an incapable judge. So don't do that. Now, again, if they're robbing banks, you, need, you may need to put them someplace where they can't rob banks anymore. Right? You may need to deal with that. But... It doesn't mean that you should judge them. So Paul, Paul is saying that. But more than that, he's saying, you're not a good judge. You're not a good judge of their wrongdoing. And by the way, you're not a good judge of your own wrongdoing. He's saying, a lot is riding on this. How confident are you of your judgment? You know, there's nothing easier than to make excuses for yourself. You know, we're, we're experts at exonerating ourselves. But that doesn't mean that God is fooled. And we shouldn't confuse God's patience and tolerance with God's um, uh, uh, acquittal. You know, the acquittal, if there is one, will come later. So the point Paul's making here is that what he began with back at the very beginning of chapter 1 is that the gospel is good news for all. He's saying, well, of course it's good news for those outsiders, the ones who do wrong, you know. They're bad people. But he's saying, now hold on a second. It's not just good news for outsiders. It's good news for insiders too. It's good news for everybody who's thinking and saying, well, actually, I'm not sure about that. You know, I always thought that they wouldn't mind if I did that. I kind of always assumed that you know, the money wasn't a big deal. Paul's saying, well, yeah, but you're not the judge. Maybe you need some good news too. So, don't judge other people, and don't judge yourself. That's, that's the lesson for today. And the application is incredibly simple. The, it, you know, I mean, feel free to walk home and say, you know, I was subjected to a diatribe. But, um, but really the application is this, come back next week, because Paul is not done. Paul is not done. All he wants to do in these first couple of chapters is to get people to understand that everybody needs good news because none of us do right. And if we do right today, does that mean we do right yesterday or tomorrow? You know, what's, what's our track record? Because the only, the only correct answer is 
If, if, we, if we have always done right, if we have never done wrong, then we have nothing to worry about there. But even then, how confident are you in that judgment? So, come back next week because Paul's got some good news for the outsiders and for the insiders. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the knowledge that you are the best judge, that you will not condemn us wrongly, that you know the reasons we do things, you know, you know our excuses. I did that. God, you know, you know, um, you know our excuses, but you also know, um, you know the the reasons we did that. We did the we do the things that we do. Lord, help us uh, to not judge others, to realize that we are not in a position where we can judge, that if anything, as insiders, we have less excuse than they do. And Lord, help us to remember that one of the people we should not judge is ourself. We pray these things through Christ our Lord. Amen.